All right. All hey, right. everybody. Welcome. Uh, we got Sean and Kristen Brothers here and and Gordon P. Um, so welcome. And uh, I know there'll be some more people coming in as well as in the uh, the uh, recording. So uh, I hope you enjoy it. So let's talk about uh, some some stuff. We're gonna last month, and I, I'm gonna do. I'm just gonna talk for a minute before we start sharing the presentation. Uh, last month, uh, not last month. Holy crap! Two weeks ago. Two weeks ago, we shared, you know, the importance of KPIs and what your KPI should look like, what to look at daily, weekly, monthly, and everything like that. This is going to go into the next step of it, okay? This is putting them to work. That's what this is going to be all about. <clears throat> so we're going to have a short time here today, but I hope you'll uh, go through with it. And if you have any questions at all, feel free. Hey, Will, how you doing? And uh, let's have some fun, okay? If you have any questions at all, uh, please uh, put them in the chat and we can come out afterwards like this and and talk face to face. I think it's pretty cool. I, I very much prefer that over the um, somebody asks me the question. So if you don't mind, put the question in the chat and then we'll talk it through. OK, so without further ado, hearing no other objections, let's rock and roll. I'm going to share my screen. I want it to be this one. And I'm going to share for sound. I don't think I have sound on, though. Okay. So can you all see my screen? Yes, Jacob, I see you shaking your head. Okay. Fantastic. So what we're going to do is talk about putting your KPIs to work. So hopefully you've had a chance to review the first uh, webinar, and you kind of understand what the KPIs are, how to use them. Uh, you're starting to measure your KPIs, right? You've created some, you've set goals for the business using your KPIs, but there's an ongoing question here that, you know, you tend to get all excited, like, wow, I got all this great information, and this is awesome, and it's going to make us a million dollars. I should say it like this, one million dollars. But the reality is, if you're like most other shops, you're asking yourself, why aren't I achieving them? Right? Why aren't I achieving them? And I think that's a big deal. So what I want to do is help you with that by going through and sharing with you, number one, the KPI, but then talk about some of the things, the major things that are going to prevent you from getting to where you want to go with them, okay? Now, this is not meant to be the end-all and be-all as far as these subject matters go. In fact, if you're at ATE coming up, we will be there. I'll be there Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Uh, so please, if you want to sit down and talk, we'll help you through it. But this is to give you a very high level understanding of it and then give you some ideas of where to look. Okay. But every shop's a little different. Every everything's every person has different goals. So I just want you to know that we're here and that this is a an overview. So let's start with our daily KPIs. Your daily KPIs again are build hours. Total build hours for the day, you should have a capacity. Your invoice count, your hours per repair order, your effective labor rate per hour, build hour, and then your parts and tire GP. These are your daily rates, uh, your daily KPIs. And please understand, if you're looking at these, what we're talking about is you look at sales every day. That's what we're saying right now. You look at sales every day. Why? Because if you're doing a good job, you've got everything dialed in and you're hitting your numbers, you'll know at a pretty high level that you should be in pretty good shape. So let's talk about build hours. What are some things that are going to cause you from hitting them, right? What are they going to, so that you end up with something lower than you'd like? Number one is a lack of clarity. What do I mean by that? If you don't understand, I just had this conversation and it's funny, I was uh, coaching a transmission shop at lunchtime in Minnesota, and we were talking about build hours and their capacity. 
And they looked at it and they were like, holy crap, this would be amazing. And I'm like, well, if you can't see it, you can't create it. And if I can't see it, I can't share it. Because here's the thing I want you to understand. KPIs are not something you get by yourself. KPIs, your key performance indicators, they're something that are achieved by the team. And, but if the team doesn't understand what those KPIs are, if they don't know what the target is, then you've got a problem. And, and, and what I mean by that is if you think about a technician, most technicians don't know how to manage time. They don't think in time, right? They think on ego. They think about, okay, I've got to fix every car. So the way they measure success is they count the number of closed hood on fixed cars that they closed, the number of hoods they close on fixed cars versus the number of hoods they opened up on broken cars. And that's good, but it's not enough. So the first thing you got to do is be clear about what you're looking for as a capacity for the entire shop. And again, think of your shop like a factory. You should be producing these number of hours so that you're you're hitting your goal, right? Because otherwise you're going to hit bottlenecks and bottlenecks prevent you from achieving the full capacity production of your shop. That's not what we're here for, right? And that's the second thing here. First of all, it's lack of clarity. You got to make sure everybody knows where you're going. But then second, there's bottlenecks. There are breakdowns in communication, workflow, parts ordering, uh, documentation, all these different areas that you can end up having issues with where you're not, they hurt your hours. See, a lot of times what happens, and we just did a webinar on this in our Pocket Business Genius uh, webinar series. Uh, it, it was all about smoothing, smoothing out operations, and it was uh, removing bottlenecks. That was the name of the webinar. And one of the things we talked about was the fact that your low hours are a byproduct of bottlenecks. 80 to 85% of the time, it's not a technician issue. It's a bottleneck. And, and the issue is from where you sit or stand in the business, you can't see it. So what you want to be able to do when you're dealing with bottlenecks is you want to talk to your team and get their perspective on things. By getting their perspective, it allows you to step back and see the business from a bigger area. And, and maybe you're missing things. Another reason why you might be having problems with your build hours is you're not getting enough cars. Okay? Here's the other thing that does it. Too many cars. Because if you have too many cars, you go into activity mode and you're just fixing broken vehicles and, and you end up not getting the hours built that you could and should because you got guys pulling cars in and out all day long. And ladies... Please understand I'm from the Northeast. And when I say the term guys, it is a non-gender specific term, okay? So I just want to make sure everybody understands that. And then the last reason why, or a really popular reason why you're not getting your build hours is estimating skills at the front counter, right? If we have a lot of a, a high emotional bank account where, man, that's a lot of money. I can't do that. Oh, they'll never buy that. Let me cut the bill down a little bit. That's a problem, okay? That's number one. It happens a lot more than you think. Uh, number two, they don't know what to bill for. Like, they don't know, hey, when I do this, I got to do this. And what I'm seeing in our industry, and it's an issue, is I'm seeing more and more advisors today coming in that do not have automotive experience. And please, don't think they're not good advisors. They are amazing advisors. They're great with people, and they know how to sell but they don't know cars. But see, for such a long time, a shop had an ex-technician as an advisor. And you know something, when it comes to writing the estimates and stuff, yeah, they might know what to put on there, but I'm gonna tell you straight up, there we're all, we were all technicians for a reason. We hate talking to people, right? Most technicians, they don't wanna talk to people. They wanna talk to cars. So putting it an ex-tech out on the front uh, on the front counter 
that might get clarity between the two, you know, front and back of the shop, but it doesn't get you sales. Okay. And the other thing that can happen when you have a tech that's an, you know, an ex tech that's an advisor, he'll look up a time, it'll say six hours, and he's like, man, I, I can do that in three. I'm going to bill it for four. And those are all issues. Okay. So that's build hours. Invoice count. Lack of clarity. What do I mean by that? What I mean is, what is your goal for invoice count every day? And please understand, car count is different from invoice count. Car count is potential. These are the number of cars you have in the building or on the par in the parking lot waiting to be worked on, okay, that haven't been done yet. This is a number we want to watch, okay? Because if we're not getting enough invoices through per day, we want to step back and say, okay, is it a marketing issue? In other words, we're running out of work or is it a bottleneck issue? Because I've got 15 cars sitting on the, uh, on the lot and I can't get them in because we can't get the work through fast enough. Invoice count is the count of invoices completed per day. So car count is the potential. Invoice count is what got completed. That's what we want to work on. You should have a goal for every technician and advisor for what that invoice count should look like. Let me give you an example. If my goal is three invoices per day per tech, and I have an advisor that working with two techs, then his or her goal is six invoices per day. So having that KPI in front of everybody is super, super important and again, you've got to make sure everybody clearly understands what the goal is and what the minimum level is, right? The minimum level of acceptable performance. So they understand what the playing field is, okay? Now, what's another reason for invoice count issues? It's either no marketing or poor marketing, right? Right? So I'm trying to see here. Let's see if I can find the guy's name. Yeah, there he is. So there was a guy in 1902 named John Wanamaker. He is the father of the department store concept. He had Wanamakers. He was in Philadelphia. And in 1902, he said something amazing. He said, half of my advertising, the money I spend on advertising is wasted. The problem is I don't know which half. Can you all see how that could be an issue? So you got to know how you're doing with your marketing. That's a big, big part of this. Okay. Now, if you're not tracking today, we got a problem. While that might have been true in Wanamaker's time, it is absolutely not true today. You should know how everybody's coming into your shop. You should know what's driving it. You should know whether it's a new client or an existing. Is it a repeat visit that you you set up? Was it a breakdown? Everything like that. We tracked everything. And here's the thing. I personally believe that if we had a regular client having their vehicle towed in, we failed. Because if we were doing our job right, if we were looking for everything, did a great ev evaluation on the vehicle and let them know what was going on, and they did the work, their car should never be on a hook. If it was, we failed. And that's not okay. All right? So you got to have you got to have tracking. We knew what everybody came in for. We knew if it was a customer or client-initiated visit or if we initiated it. Super important. Next... With invoice count, there's got to be follow-up. And here's why. Because maybe you made a presentation to your client, and for whatever reason, they didn't do it all. You want to have a way that you can nurture that lead and get them back in at a later date. See, when we talk about sales, there's two basic methodologies. There's hunting which is where we get up in the morning, we walk out of the cave with our club, 
We walk around till we hit something over the head and kill it. We drag it back to the cave and we cook it. That's hunting. Our industry, that is our main way to go. Right? People bring their cars. We give them what they, what do we tell them what they need? And what do they do? They go yes or no. And if they say no, we, pu we pull a Kevin O'Leary on them from Shark Tank. And we say, what? You're dead to me. Get out. And we go to the next one. It's not the way to do it. What we want to do is the second. We want to incorporate both of these methodologies into our sales process. And the second one is called farming. And farming is where I plant a seed today to reap a harvest tomorrow. Right? But you know what the biggest problem is? You guys, you're not getting enough cars in every day or you find yourself slow. Like we're seeing shops getting really, really busy and then slow, dead slow again. And here's the issue. The issue is this. They're not farming. Right? They're not, they're not, they're not planting the seeds so that they can reap a harvest. And, and then when they get really, really slow, what they want to do is plant the seed today and reap the harvest today. And it doesn't work that way. Okay? Does not work that way. So you got to make sure you're doing a regular follow-up and nurturing. Hey, man, just wanted to thank you for coming in a month ago. You rec We recommended these things. You declined at the time. Here's the repercussions. If you don't do them, give us a call. We'll get them taken care of for you. And then the last thing is, uh, who's in charge of the pipeline? This is like a gray area today in shops that I don't understand it. Shop owner thinks the advisor's doing it. The advisor thinks the shop owner's doing it. And it's no man's land. Nobody's doing it. So I want you to understand that the advisors are responsible for the pipeline. The advisors are responsible to make sure there's enough cars every single day in that shop to work on. Okay. Now they got to work with the owners and the managers to make sure the marketing is getting the phone to ring, but we are a cl too close industry. Somebody calls and says, asks how much is, or my car needs, or, um, you know, uh, you know, I I've had it to other shops, whatever the case is, we've got to do a really great job at converting that inquiry into an appointment and then once we get the vehicle in we've got to go through it and then we're going to write an estimate and present what we found and that's our second close but you need to understand that the advisors are in charge of making sure there's enough work for everybody in the shop every day now here's what happens with most shops let's say you're normally billed out you're, you're booked out five days Fantastic. And you always seem like you're chasing your tail. You can't get ahead. It's it's just like, uh, whatever, I can't get caught up. And then things all of a sudden start to loosen up a little bit. And you find yourself getting caught up with the work that's been there for a while. And when you get all that work done, all of a sudden you turn around and you look and you've got no work for the day at all. And then if you'll pardon my French, that's the oh shit trigger. Right. That's where we go. Oh, crap. I got no work. I got to do something about it. I want to give you one tip right now that will completely change your shop. OK, if you get nothing else out of these two webinars, this one tip will make you money. If you're normally booked out five days. I want your advisors to be very, very aware of the schedule. And the moment your schedule drops to four days, that becomes the oh shit trigger. At four days, you're like, holy crap, I got to turn up the heat. I got to start making some phone calls. I got to call past people. I got to call people that are waiting on parts that are sitting here. I got to do this. I got to do that. And you want to get it back up to five days. If your advisors do that, you'll never have a slow day again in your shop. That's pretty cool. Okay. So you got to know who's in charge. Next, let's talk about hours per RO. Hours per repair order is an amazing number. What it does is it lets you see how well you're doing at maximizing the opportunity that's in the bays now. Okay. For a general repair shop, three to three and a half hours is a, is a nice, healthy number. 
European shop, four to five. Uh, diesel shop, eight to 10. Transmission shop, typically 11 to 13. That's where your hours per repair order should be. So what's the first thing that's going to cause a problem here? Number one, a lack of clarity. Are you noticing a pattern yet here with this first one? If you don't share what your goals and expectations are, how does your team step up to help you? And what happens is you're not getting what you want from them, but you're getting upset. And you're getting upset because you're not getting what you want, but they don't know what you want. So how could they give you what you need? So that's something to think through, okay? You're gonna see that one on every slide. Next is too many cars. You got to understand that as the hours, as car count goes up, hours per hour drop. It's a natural byproduct. They have an inverse relationship. And this is why I have such a problem with, you know, we just need more cars. We just need more cars. We need more cars. I'm going to tell you probably 85% of the time I start working with a shop. They don't have a car count problem. They have an opportunity, taking advantage of an opportunity problem. The opportunities are there. In fact, I'm working with one shop right now uh, on cutting their car count by 40%. That's what we're working on doing. And then as we're doing that, working on getting the hours per repair order up, and they're going to make way more money, almost double the money on like 40% less cars. So the whole say yes to everything, I need more cars, blah, blah, blah. No, okay? What else drives poor hours per RO? If you don't talk to your client and understand what your client wants for their vehicle, they're not gonna buy from you, okay? You need three things for your, your client to say yes to you. Number one, they need to trust you. And then number two, you gotta create a need and number three, you got to create a sense of urgency. That's our job on the front counter. Not in a bad way, not in a false way, but we've got to be able to do that. But we've also got to be able to connect. We've got to be able to understand what they're looking for and help them achieve their goals. Okay? So an advisor has four primary issues or situations uh, that they can improve in. Number one, their confidence and mindset level right? How they show up. That's the first thing they can work on. Second thing is qualifying. It's your job as an advisor or for your advisors to make sure that high win probabilities are coming into the shop, not low win probabilities. Low win probabilities can be based on what's going on with the car, what their plans are for the car, or them as a human being, basically, the way they're showing up. Right. There's just some people that aren't worth, you know, marrying. And come on, how cool would it be if someone called up or walked walked into the shop if the if the wedding march started up? Right. So you hear that and you're like, nope, I'm out. See you later. I already got one ring. I ain't getting no more. Right. So that's a big deal. You want to make sure you're doing a great interview with your client. When you do a really great interview with your client, what you're doing is you're getting them from being a spectator, which is what they're used to being, and you're making them a part of it, a participant in the game. So they get more engaged. It differentiates you as a shop. It just makes a huge difference. So the four things an advisor has got to be really good at. Number one, confidence and mindset. Number two, qualifying. Number three, connecting. Right, That's what this is all about, is connecting so that we understand where they're coming from. We understand wh why they bought stuff. We understand what's triggering this, this visit so that we can help them. Then we have to be able to present. That's number three. Okay. And number, I'm sorry, number four. And number five is overcome objections. Right? We've, and understand an objection is just a concern. They have a concern you didn't talk about. Sit down and listen to them, ask questions, but you've got to have that interview. 
We call it a discovery conversation. Super, super important. The goal in your discovery conversation, number one, is to understand the past with the vehicle, right? Why did they buy that vehicle? Would they buy it again? You know, I want to know all of these things so I understand where they're, well, how they feel about the vehicle. Number two, how are they using it today and who's using it? Number three, what their future plans are. What baggage are they bringing to the table? And then lastly, how's life treating them right then and there? What's their situation look like? I need to know those five things so that I can navigate the landmines. Because each and every one of us, we have landmines all around us. And it's my goal not to step on one. So super important. How about no inspection process? You'd be amazed at how many shops still don't do a consistent, positive, proper inspection on a vehicle to make sure that it is safe, reliable, and efficient. Huge. What else hurts hours per hour? You don't have a testing process process or strategy. And what do I mean by that? You, How many of you have check engine lights and everything else you got to work with? Do you have a process in place, a strategy in place that helps you maintain gross profit through a testing operation? Most don't. So this is super, super important. What else affects hours per RO? How about being completely activity mindset? I'll give you a, a, a position in the companies that really scare me in a shop. And that's a general service tech. You're, you know, that's doing your oil services. That guy scares me. Here's why. You have the least qualified person typically working on the most vehicles a month. And when you give them an oil service to do, notice I didn't say oil change, but an oil service. When you give them an oil service to do, they're just about getting it done quick. See, they're completely activity dri driven and based instead of being opportunity focused. So way, way important. How about working on too many vehicles? That's going to drop hours per RO. How about not having a maintenance program in place? We drank the BG Pro uh, Who Late a long time ago. They've got some amazing products. They work really well. So I highly recommend having some kind of maintenance program in there. And then we have poor sales skills. If I have somebody on the front counter that's not great at selling, is that going to affect my hours per RO? Absolutely it will. Okay, next, let's talk about effective labor rate per build hour. First thing is a lack of clarity. Next, you're not billing for your time, right? You got, doll you got time going into a vehicle, but you're not billing for it. Let me give you an example. Let's say, I'm just going to use a number. Let's say you're paying a tech $45 an hour. Your labor rate's $125, and that's what you charge for te testing. You give it to your tech, and he, and he spends three hours working on that vehicle. So you charge $125, and you're paying him $45, so it's going to cost you, what, $135? Do, does anybody see a problem with this? That's what's going on. So you got to make sure that you're billing and getting paid for everybody's time, okay? You don't want to be doing work at, that nobody is going to get paid for. Here's another example. Hey, I want you to stay late. Can you get my car done? I can, but I'm going to pay overtime. That's a problem for me. Does that chew into my profit and such? And the answer is yes. So what if I had an overtime labor rate, which was time and a half your regular labor rate? Somebody says, hey, can you work overtime? I can. Uh, unfortunately, it's going to put my techs into overtime. 
I'm going to have to bump the labor a little bit to cover that. But if you want it done tonight, I can make it happen. Works really well. Next, canned jobs. How many y'all, all you got to do is smile, but how many y'all set up your canned jobs 10 years ago when you got your computers or 15 years ago and never went back and updated the times and such? I see it all the time. Okay? So you want to make sure that's happening. Discounting hurts your effective labor rate. If you're putting labor discounts in, it's going to hurt the effective labor rate per build hour. Same thing with special promotions or coupons. And then another real killer is fleets. If you have a fleet that you're giving a substantially lower rate to, I would really ask you to revisit that because your labor changes, your labor charges don't change, right? Whatever you're going to pay for your tax, that doesn't change. And then last, how about you car dealers? Do they have an impact on our effective labor? Yeah. Typically, they don't. They want the car fixed for nothing. And it can get ugly, right? We don't want to do that. Next, we have parts and tires. So again, a lack of clarity. What are your goals? And then here's another big one for your parts and tire GP. Is price really the issue? You know, some of you might say, hey, if I buy a part at the dealer and it's 150 bucks, I'll sell it for 180. That's a 20% markup. But if it was a world part, a world pack part for that same $150 and they, um, you would normally double that price. What's the difference? What's the difference? I'm going to tell you, it's an emotional bank account and it's on our end, not anybody else's. A part's a part. So what I want you to do is when you get your dealer parts, I want, to, I want you to put your name over the name on top of the invoice. And as you're putting it into your regular matrix, go world pack, it's world pack, it's world pack. And just let it go. Let the money do its thing. Let your matrix do its thing. It's super important. Next, we have weekly issues, right? Our KPIs, we have gross profit, Parts to labor, oil services, new customer percentage, um, number of percentage of reviews, percentage of referrals. <clears throat> so let's look at each one. Gross profit. Why aren't I hitting it? Number one, no clarity. Number two, I set a target gross profit, but I never did anything to the individual income streams like we talked about last, uh, I was going to say last month, a couple weeks ago. Where if I gotta have a I gotta I gotta have a gross profit per goal for labor, a gross profit goal for parts, sublets, supplies, fees, all of those need a gross profit target, and those are gonna help me achieve my overall gross profit. Now I told you guys last time, sixty five percent is really the rule. Um, sometimes it can change a little bit based on the mar uh, the market you're in. But overall, you want to make sure you've got an, a gross profit target for each income stream. Please understand that numbers will never give you answers. Numbers only create questions. So when you're looking at your P&L and something doesn't look right, you're not going to know the answer looking at your P&L. You're going to know where to look, right? If your P&L is set up right, you're going to know to, where to look. Next, we have our parts to labor. What does that mean? We want to look at your ratio of parts dollars, parts sales dollars to labor sales dollars. If it's too high, you're not charging enough for labor. You're giving it away. And most of the time, it's diagnostic or testing that's given away. What we want it to be is or oh, you're charging too much for parts yeah i've only seen that once and actually i that's not true i had somebody that was at 60 percent parts gross profit which was 
more aggressive than I would have been. And she said to me, do I have to fix it? And I said, is anybody complaining? And she said, no. And then I said, no, leave it right where it is. You're fine. Now, if it's too low, you're not charging enough for parts or you get a labor mix issue. You're doing a lot of diag work and you're not getting the sales. So that could be an issue. Our sweet spot is 0.8 to 1. Next, we have our oil services. Why do we need this? Number one, because it helps us. Please understand an oil service is the only service your clients know to ask for. They know they got to have it done. Don't turn this away. Don't think it's a piece of crap. Don't wish you never did them because these are golden opportunities. Okay, that's what they're there for. What you want to be able to do is understand that if you don't have a goal, you're going to have a lack of clarity. Nobody knows what you want. I'm going to tell you in my shop, we were looking for 50%. Now, the other issue I see with this is where you're still thinking oil changes. When was the last time changing one fluid in a car will create a scenario where the car will remain dependable, reliable, and efficient? And I hope we can all agree nowhere. Or thinking they're a waste of time. They're not. We, uh, with three techs, we did about 160 to 180 invoices a month. We were averaging four hours of labor per ticket. And about 100, 105 of them started out as oil services. So we were able to upsell what we found. Now, new customer. Again, why are you having a problem? No clarity. You don't have an idea. But here's the other thing. You're not tracking where they're coming from. So again, you get stuck. You got to be keep dumping and dumping and dumping and dumping advertising. If you're not getting what you want, I had one client in St. Louis. He was spending 18% of sales on advertising. That is ludicrous. And I said to him, I said, that's way too much money. He goes, Rick, I, I'm planning on going up. I'm not getting any cars. I'm not getting the customers I need. So I said, listen, what is marketing there to do? And he said, it's there to get them in the shop. And I said, no, it's there to make the phone ring. So how are we doing at that? So when we dug in, his advisors were closing two out of 10 calls coming in from the marketing. So we trained the advisors and we got them to six call. They were getting converting six out of 10 and his sales tripled. Okay. So don't think you got to spend all kinds of money. Be smart about it. Next. What about reviews? Reviews, man. Yeah. You got to have clarity on it. Most of us don't. Most of us, the review is a byproduct. Why? Okay. You should have a goal for reviews. But here's the thing, and I really need you to hear me on this. Because this is your business, you are the author of your story. And, and the reality is you have an opportunity to make that story a moment of misery, a moment of mediocrity, or a moment of magic. And I need you to understand the only way you're going to get a review is if you're in moment of magic on the high end of moment of magic, or if you're in the moment of misery, either one of those will get reviews in the middle. You don't. Why? Because it's mediocre. I got what I paid for. You weren't that great. I I'm not giving you a review. Okay. What's another reason why you don't ask for it. You need to ask for the reviews. 
And then you don't make it easy. You got to make leaving a review so easy. Super, super important. So now what about referrals? Well, it's kind of the same thing, right? We're going to start off with lack of clarity. And again, if, if someone's getting mediocre service from me, are they going to recommend their friends? No, man, they got one foot out the door. They're just, they're just biding their time. So I've got to create moments of magic over and over and over again where people feel really special, okay? The next thing is we don't ask for the referral. When's the best time to ask for the referral? The best time to ask for the referral is right after they pay their bill and they say thank you. You see, unconsciously, when someone says I says thank you, they're beholding to you. There's a sense where they owe you. So it's super important to ask there, and you want to make it as easy as possible for the referrals. Okay? Sorry there, I think I froze for a sec. Now we have monthly KPIs. So I want you to understand, daily we're looking at sales. Weekly, if you pay your staff weekly, we're looking at gross profit. Monthly, we're looking at expenses and net income. Does that make it easier? I hope that makes it easier for people, okay? So yes, we have this stuff here. Uh, some of it I'm going to blow through, uh, the balance sheet stuff. We have another class that goes really deep into the financials in the morning, and then we go through the KPIs and put them together. Uh, but we're not, we don't have time for the last four here, the current ratio, quick ratio, debt ratio, and debt to equity. Yeah, that was four. Okay. So let's talk about expenses. What's the first problem? You got no clarity on it. You're just there whacking against a mountain of weeds trying to get to the end of the day. It's not going to work. Because why? Because whatever you don't watch grows. It's one of Rick's rules. Whatever you don't watch, it grows. What's the other reason? We're sloppy. And then the last thing we got to do is we got to make sure we have a budget. I know that's a dirty B word, but it's important today. Then we have our net income. Again, lack of clarity. And the biggest thing we see with uh, the net income is no goal. Right? We're just going to wait to the end of the month and see if we're profitable. Here's the problem with that. <laughs> the profit fairy ain't coming to slip profit at the, under the pillow, uh, under your pillow at the end of the month. Because the profit fairy is out having beer with the tooth fairy. It's the way it is. What you do need is a profit model. Now there's current ratio. This is a balance sheet item to look at the short-term health of your company. We're not going to worry about this, but you got your lack of clarity. You got to improve sales and reduce liabilities. Quick ratio. This is the same thing, but we're going to back inventory out. Lack of clarity, overstocked. You're, you got to get rid of some inventory. Uh, improve your assets, reduce your liabilities. Debt ratio. This is debt ratio. I mean, I'm sorry, lack of clarity, right? And then stop buying on terms. Stop taking loans out, okay? I was helping a shop just this past month buy a loan, and he was going to get a lease, and it was, a, it was not a good lease. How many have been stuck with a lease that was really not favorable? Like, you could have gotten way better at the bank, right, as far as an interest rate and stuff. Um, but you want to get it so you're not doing that, right? You don't want to have loans. You want to be able to, this guy, instead of buying the lease, uh, the lift through the lease, 
we actually set it up as 30, 60, 90 payments. And he paid for a third of the lift every 30 days. It was his. So that really works. And another way to do it is pay with cash. And here's the thing. When I got divorced from my first wife, I'd never seen someone skate checks like she could. I never saw anybody do a negative balance like she could and not have things bounce. Today, I think it would be harder. Thankfully, she's an ex-wife. So, um, yeah, so for seven years, I didn't have a checking account. I paid my bills with cash. And guess what? It was awesome because I had no debt. I think that's important, okay? Debt to equity. This is basically to see how much of the company is owned by the owners. You should have a goal for this. And we do. We talked about it a couple weeks ago. And the way you fix this is to improve assets and reduce your debt. Then we have yearly KPIs. These aren't too bad. You want to look at your inventory turns. Now, today, that's not as bad as it used to be. I can tell you when I had my shop, I think I had, and this is back in the day we were getting 60, 70 bucks an hour for labor. I had probably 40, $50,000 in inventory. But we used it all, right? We turned it, but we had to make sure that we were getting enough, okay? So you got to make sure you have a goal for this. Five to seven turns is the goal per year. Because if you're not getting it, it means you're overstocked. I walked into one truck, stop, one truck sh uh, shop, Fort Walton Beach, Florida, right on the panhandle. It was the first time I, I put my toes in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, I still think you can see the slick from it. I'm not sure. It was a while ago. But anyway... Um, he had $450,000 in inventory. That is way too much. That's nuts. Okay. What you want to be able to do is order parts better and take advantage of hot shot delivery. Then you have a return on equity. If you don't have a number for this, it's a lack of clarity. You need to know what it is. You want a return on the money you've invested in your shop. Most shop owners get stuck. What they do is they get stuck First, they get a shop, they either buy one or they start one. And then they work themselves up and, they, and they're and they basically killing themselves for a really sh crappy paycheck, right? I was talking to a shop owner just two weeks ago, three weeks ago. He was paying himself $300 a week. $300 a week. Where can you live for 300 bucks a week? It's nuts. Right, you got to be able to know what you're looking for. So you you're going to make an investment in this business, and again, most shop owners they get stuck creating a paycheck. Now, sometimes you get management training, you get some coaching, and that paycheck gets better, but it's still the business is still dependent upon you. You're not creating the business for what the business should be created for, which is an entity that can live on its own. Imagine having kids. How many of y'all, raise your hands, you got kids, right? How many have kids? Imagine having a child born and you're gonna say to yourself, I'm gonna make every decision for this child for the rest of its life, right? Shoot me. I got seven kids, shoot me. My goal as a parent was to raise responsible, healthy members of society that could learn and apply what we taught them and go out on their own and do things. And that's exactly what you should be doing with your business. You should be creating a business that is an absentee owner situation where it will make money without your active presence. In the meantime, we are here to make sure that your investment, you're getting a return on that investment, not your paycheck. You're getting paid over here for what you do in the business. Your return on equity is a distribution, and you should be getting those on a regular basis. That way there, you're getting that money, is that money that you put into the business is making your money back. That's what it should be, okay? 
quarterly, monthly to quarterly dividends is what you'd be going for. If you're not doing that, you're not getting a good return on equity, you've got to improve your assets and reduce your debt. Customer attrition. Is your database shrinking? Most people don't even think about this, right? So there's no clarity to it and you're not measuring. What does this do? Okay. Uh, most shops, uh, not most shops, every shop that I've done a study on, probably over the years, 50, 60, 70 shops, they lose between 17 and 21% of their database every year. So is your database shrinking? Could that be why things are slowing down and you're not replacing them, right? You don't know, but what's causing it? It could be poor marketing or not marketing, not keeping the clients, right? You're you're going in, they're coming in, and and and, and but they're not you're not connecting with them, you're not creating a relationship with them the way you could and should, and you're not chasing them. So you want to measure the people that haven't been in within a certain date range and compare it to the number of people that are new for that date range. And you want to make sure that the new people are higher than the people that haven't been in. So if I've lost 100 people in a year that haven't come back and I only brought 50 people in, I'm losing two people for every one I'm bringing in. That does not work. If I have 100 people that have not not been back and I have 200 people coming in, now I have two people coming in for everyone leaving, that makes sense. So you want to measure your attrition rate every single year, okay? Now, we've got some really cool bonus materials for you as far as helping you with these KPIs. If you're interested, all you've got to do, grab your phone, scan the QR code right here. And I don't know if you've seen it, but people, you gotta be careful with QR codes. There are people putting up, like in your parking garages and stuff, they're putting up QR code stickers over the ones that are there and you scan it and they're getting the money, not the garage. And they take money out of your account. Don't do that. You'll notice any one of our, anytime we have a QR code, you'll always see our logo in it. Okay. They can't do that. Only we can do that, okay? That's a special process. All you gotta do is scan it. We'll give you the additional material, okay? So what I'm gonna do right now is just finish up and then I'll come back to this in case you need it. How high you're gonna fly in your business, it's gonna start with how well you measure. And here's the thing now, you've spent a couple hours with me and I love that, thank you so much. But the reality is, if you change nothing, you've wasted my time, you've wasted yours, and your business is going to stay the same. Let's not do that, okay? So at that point, I want to say thank you, open it up to any questions, and what I will do is go back to the QR code in case somebody wants it. Okay, I'm here. Questions, comments, concerns? None? I did that good a job? Holy crap, that's awesome. It's unusual. Typically, we got some questions. Gordon, I appreciate you being in here today. Thank you. Sean, Christian Brothers, Jerry, Todd, Terry, I appreciate you all. Thank you so much. Um, listen, one of the things I talk about all the time when I do these webinars, if you're implementing anything and run into a snag, feel free to reach out, okay? Over 60 days, the next 60 days, just reach out. We'll set up a time, no expectation, absolutely free. I want to help you guys out, okay? So thank you very much. And uh, I don't see any questions, Jacob or Joanna, so I think we're good. And uh, if I don't hear from you, I will see you all at ATE, all right? So come on in. We got a couple of classes we're teaching. We'd love to have you in there. Thank you all so much. God bless. Go Thank make some right. money. Take care.